morning, everybody, and welcome to the first seminar session of ISVEX 2023. Thank you all for joining so promptly. We appreciate it. Um, obviously, we've got a pretty packed program today, so we'll try and keep everything running nicely to time. The first lecture today is the Hopkins Baldwin Lecture. And Ron Bakar is going to be giving us that lecture today. We have the two gentlemen that the lecture is named after watching over us here. Um, and the topic of the lecture is about how to offer good quality, um, but also make some money, because after all, we are all in business as much as we appreciate our technical excellence and we try to do the best. Um, we're all running some kind of business which has a commercial element to it that we can't ignore. I asked Ron earlier how he um, came into the industry, because quite often that's an interesting story. It's often a very convoluted route. However, Ron seems to have taken a fairly straight line into doing what he's doing today in that he had an interest in music and a very keen interest in electronics and kind of went for both of them at the same time and found that a good home in the Yamaha Corporation allowing him to kind of fulfil both of those sides of sometimes what some of us find are at odds with each other. So um, what well, well done, Ron, for finding the, the, the golden path into the industry. So without further ado, I'm going to ask Ron to come and give us his lecture, please. Thank you, Ron. Thanks a lot. Uh, by the way, that was 35 years ago. I don't believe it. <laughs> yeah, it, it's true. Good morning. Good morning. Um, my name is Ron. I'm a Dutch guy from Holland, from Amsterdam, and I work already 35 years for Yamaha Music Europe as systems marketing manager. Um, that sounds more marketing than it is. Um, my daily job is more focused to technology and the introduction of technology in, uh, in Europe. Um, just a very brief introduction of our company. Um, our head office, the Yamaha head office, is in Hamamatsu in Japan. And um, worldwide, we have about 20,000 employees all creating musical instruments and pro audio equipment. We're the largest musical instrument and pro audio manufacturer on the planet. And Nexo, which is a part of Yamaha, uh, the head, head office is in Playy. This is near Paris in France. Um, Yamaha makes a lot of things, pianos, guitars, hi-fi equipment, uh, but maybe we're best known for our digital processors and digital mixing consoles. Um, and we're pioneering that area since the late 80s. And Nexo is um, uh, well known for the modular, high-quality modular loudspeaker systems. And together, about five years ago, we started to develop an approach to immersive sound and created uh, immersive technologies and an immersive ecosystem together. Um, so that's why I present both companies and we, we bring that to the market as a company group, Yamaha and Nexo. Um, my story is about immersive sound. That's a hot topic nowadays. Um, and to approach it from the viewpoint of the investor. And immersive, uh, immersive sound, if I walk around, will this still be okay, sound-wise? Okay. Um, immersive sound basically uh, means two parts. It's about acoustics and it's about sound reinforcement. Um, and when I talk about the viewpoint of the investor, it's about making money to make sure that there's revenue enough to finance the productions and finance the venues uh, in which all these uh, wonderful productions take place. So, on the screen you will see appearing some companies who are now promoting, heavily promoting, immersive sound technologies. Um, and they're all loudspeaker manufacturers. And of course, for them, this makes sense because for immersive sound systems, you need a lot of loudspeakers. So for a loudspeaker manufacturer, that's a very profitable business. 
And um, as I work for one of them, maybe it's a little bit dodgy that I'm trying to make the case um, for, uh, from the viewpoint of the investor, but there are some valid reasons why immersive sound is also very interesting and very valid uh, from the investor point of view. And with investor, I mean venues and uh, productions. Um, the basic question to answer is why do we buy concert tickets? This is basically geared to entertainment, but basically the same thing goes for professional communication like presentation systems. Um, <clears throat> first, um, the material that we listen to with concerts is the same material as we would listen to on our home, in our home stereo set or our home systems. So there is a reason why we go to a live concert, and one of the reasons is to engage with the artist, to see the artist with real airwaves and with real photons is something different than listening at home to a stream or a CD. Um, <clears throat> the second reason is that it's live. A concert is almost always live, and just like watching a football game, is more interesting live than watching a football game on television from a month ago. Um, life is more, just more exciting. And another aspect is that you can go to a concert and enjoy a performance together with other fans of the artist or fans of the genre. That's a very strong motivator to buy a concert ticket. So these are three social parameters of reasons why uh, why we buy concert tickets. Then there's, of course, the visual experience. And in many cases, the visual experience can exceed the visual experience that you can enjoy at home uh, or on a television, for example. Uh, think about opera, where the scenery is a big part of the production, or uh, a concert by Rammstein with the, all the explosions and the lights. So that's a very uh, important part uh, of the reason, but the most important part is, of course, the oral experience, the sound experience. Um, all these components together represent the entertainment value of the production. And the entertainment value leads to a ticket price. The more entertaining, the higher the ticket price can be. And it leads to an audience size. The higher the entertainment value, the more consumers will be interested to attend and buy a concert ticket. Um, of course, we are approaching this from the sound point of view, so we'll go deeper into the aureal experience and we leave the visual for now, but that's a, com a completely different discussion thing that maybe uh, it's okay for a, next, for a next presentation by a video and light guy. This is about audio. Um, the oral experience, so the quality of the, of the listening experience, is determined, of course, by the performance quality of the artist. It's not determined by the composition or by the music piece, because you have the choice of listening at a concert or listening at home, and it's the same composition and the same piece, so that's not a, a differential parameter. The real difference is the quality of the performance, the performance of the artist. Um, especially for the acoustic arts, acoustics are of course very important. They can make or break um, a performance of an acoustic soloist or an, an orchestra. And if the performance is amplified, then the quality of the sound reinforcement system is a parameter. So the oral, oral experience depends on those three parameters, at least in my story. There might be more, but I concentrate, I focus on these three. Um, acoustics and sound reinforcement are uh, kind of techno technological parameters. We can influence them by designing uh, acoustic spaces and designing sound systems. Um, but Acoustics and sound reinforcement quality heavily influence the performance quality. An orchestra will perform better in good acoustics. So the audience from the, for the performance has two benefits. First, the sound is better for the audience. 
but second, the, performance, the performers will play better, so you have a double benefit for the audience. It's a very strong relationship, and the same is true for sound reinforcement. If the sound reinforcement is perfect, you can have a, the artist can have a very good concert. If it's poor, there's a lot of feedback, then the artist will feel a little bit uh, not, not, so, not so well, usually. Okay, I'd like to start with making the case for acoustic quality, because acoustics is an immersive thing. Um, and the tagline here is that each genre, each, each music genre, needs its own acoustics to be at the top quality level. And to illustrate it, I made a, a, a short lineup of music genres, from cinema, rock, all the way to, um, to choir performances in churches, for example, for religious music. And each of these genres need, for example, uh, their optimum reverberation time. And there are two par acoustic parameters that are most important for all of these genres, which is reverberation time and field strength. Field strength is a little bit uh, complicated, but to make it simple, I just took, took the reverberation time. But of course, for each genre, there's also a field strength, um, uh, a need for, for the accurate field strength to go with the reverberation time. Um, the most, or the best way to offer this to the, to the audiences and the performance is to build a venue for each music genre. Um, this is absolutely the best way to support uh, performances, but it's also the most expensive way because you need to buy a lot of, a lot of venues. And if um, these venues are built in a large city with one million plus um, inhabitants, then you might be able to fill the venue every day for concerts. There might be enough listeners interested to buy a concert ticket to do, uh, to do this. But in smaller towns, the occupation of the venue will be not 100% because there will simply not be enough um, customers interested enough in the music genre to buy a ticket. So this is viable for large cities and large, large areas with a dense population, but not for mid-sized and small-sized towns and even villages. So the next best solution is to buy, uh, to buy, to build uh, performance spaces for a certain genre, optimized for a for certain genre, but then allow other genres who are just at the left, lower RT or the right, higher RT, to also perform in that venue, which means that only one genre has the perfect acoustics, but all the other genres who perform there have less perfect acoustics, and the, f the genres further away um, simply cannot play in that venue because the acoustics are too weird and, and too different from what they need to have a, a reasonably quality um, performance. So as an example, maybe a, a city with 50,000 inhabitants or 100,000 can have a rock stage, a theater, a concert hall and a few churches. This would take care of all the genres and it might raise enough interest for uh, customers in that area to buy tickets to concerts in these venues. Um, another way of dealing with this for smaller populations is to build a venue that is optimized with acoustics for the lowest, um, the lowest RT music genre, genre you would like to uh, program in that venue. And in this case, it's, for example, a theater that is optimized for drama or cabaret. And then use an acoustic um, uh, variable acoustic systems to extend the ac acoustics by mechanical means or electronic means um, to a larger, uh, a larger reverberation time to allow also all the genres on the right to have the perfect acoustics. So this is different from, uh, from a compromise venue where all the different all the uh, genres who are not the, the target of the venue have worse acoustics, but this is just um, a variable acoustics which can optimize the acoustics for any genre up to a certain point. And this variability can go up to more than 100%, so more than double the reverberation time. Okay? 
an example of acoustic variability uh, using mechanical means is the uh, Symphony Hall in Birmingham, but there are many more halls who use uh, similar methods, and um, I find this method very visual because you can see that uh, absorptive panels can be slit, uh, can be put behind an, a reflective wall with a sliding system. So when the reverberation time has to be lower, the red absorptive panels are are put in place, and when we need a higher reverberation time, you slide them away, and then the wall behind them is more reflective, and then the acoustics go up. It's a very, very simple system. Um, often you also see panels that you can flip, flipping panels. One side is reflective, the other side is absorptive, or uh, curtains, of course, or curtains that are uh, suspended from the ceiling, like banners that you can pull down or deploy or leave, leave out. So these are ways to mechanically uh, vary the acoustics in the venue. This is an example of a concert hall, uh, which also has a, a, a variable acoustic system. And all the black things, the black bits you see is the main PA and the lights. And you cannot see the, the acoustic system, which exists of more than 100 loudspeakers, but they're all hidden behind the fabric of the ceiling and behind the fabric of the walls. So the, 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 the concert goer, the, the listener, will never see the system. And if, we, if it's correctly tuned, we'll also never notice that the system is in place because the acoustics match the performance that is going on in that, in that room. Um, the electronic, the active solution, tends to be a little bit, a little bit more cost-effective than a mechanical solution. Uh, for example, the mechanical solution can also include a raceable ceiling, so you can raise the ceiling of a concert hall by five or, or more meters, and this is, of, of course, very, very expensive, and compared to that, um, an electronic solution is, is maybe a factor of 10 less expensive. At the same time, it gives a bigger variability, uh, more than 100% uh, is, is basically impossible uh, if you do it by mechanics alone. Another example, or a nice example that applies both methods, is the opera, uh, the castle opera in Poland. Um, they tuned or they built the venue uh, to be optimal for their opera, and in their, their vision that's 1.4 seconds reverberation time. And uh, they deploy banners on all the walls, and if they have a, a musical or a pop concert, they lower the banners and they can go down to uh, 1.1 second, and if they have a philharmonic orchestra, they pull up the banners and they switch on an acoustic, an active acoustic enhancement system, and then they go, can go up to 1.9 seconds, uh, supporting a philharmonic orchestra, for example. Um, last example I want to show is a little bit of an extreme ex example. Aukra is a fjord, an island in Norway, with about a few thousand inhabitants. And in Norway, Norway is a rich country, they will want to make sure, they're also a cultural country, they want to make sure that every community, every commune in Norway has a place to do art. Um, so in this island a few years ago, uh, the government uh, decided to raise the money to give them an, a multi, multi-functional, multi-purpose hall. And this hall is combined with a swimming pool um, a music school and a theater. And of course, that's the only hall in the, on the island, so this hall has to do everything. So they went a little bit lower with the default acoustics to 0 0.7 seconds, so they can also do proper cinema, uh, cinema uh, um, seeing there. And with an electronic system, an active acoustic system, they can go up to 1.8 seconds and they can invite the occasional uh, symphonic orchestra to, to do a performance there. So that's a, a very small population, and by making the whole super variable, they can still program the whole and make it worthwhile and cover the, the operational cost of keeping the whole and keeping all the productions uh, alive on that island. And this is basically the biggest part of the market for um, acoustic enhancement systems, immersive acoustic enhancement systems. So, the money question, because it all boils down to customers buying concert tickets. If we can apply high 
quality variable acoustics, then the venue, the hall, can support more music genres. And this way, the hall can earn more money in a limited population because you can program more music genres in the same space. So different, different music genres can have the optimum acoustics and it's good enough for customers to seduce them to pay money for a concert tickets. So this is my first um, case for applying immersive technology uh, from the viewpoint of the investor. Then we go back to the um, overall oral experience, which was one of the five factors in the entertainment value. And we did acoustics quality, and now we go into sound reinforcement quality. And this is what all these loudspeaker companies are talking about. Because the acoustics quality, the variable acoustics, exists already since 1980, and is now developed to a state that it's really, really good and, and good enough for opera and, and well-known concert, concert halls to apply. And the orchestra often doesn't know, even know or notice that the system is in place. They're, they're really high quality. Um, sound reinforcement, um, immersive sound reinforcement is now starting. Uh, we are now in the so-called uh, innovator stage. And we're now at this moment moving to the early adopter space, uh, stage. So innovator means uh, test projects and very large projects who are trying out immersive technology. And now we see more mid-size and even low, uh, small-size productions um, trying out immersive technologies and starting to invest in immersive systems. Okay. The tagline for sound reinforcement quality uh, that we came up with is immersive is the new stereo. Um, and I will try to explain why, why we chose this. Um, the young generation, so between 20 and 35 years, um, if you observe them in their music listening behavior, you will probably see this. Everybody is listening to music on personal devices, streaming uh, from Spotify or some other uh, streaming platform. And um, this is massive. And the machines they do they use for this are headphones. This can be professional headphones with closed shells or, um, well, I think I guess more than 90% of the cases it's wireless Bluetooth headphones uh, that you don't even see if you, if you don't know that someone is wearing them. Um, the left graph is a study from 2015 from Canada um, claiming that young adults spend about seven hours of listening time um, on headphones per week. Um, and also 50 to 80 years old, still 5.2 hours per, per week listening time on headphones, uh, which I, was, I, I thought it would be lower. Um, I couldn't find any newer data because all the data I could find since 2015 is about headphone sales. And this goes through the roof. There are more and more headphones sold every year, but headphone usage is now probably way, way more than eight hours per week. And just to be uh, clear, uh, a study from 2022 claims, in the US claims that um, 87%, so um, almost 90% of the users use their headphones to listen to music. They also listen to other things, but for uh, almost 90%, they use their headphones to listen to music, just to back up the claim statistically. Um, headphones are basically stereo sound reinforcement devices, but um, in the recent years, more and more devices start to have some form of immersivity in them. Um, for example, um, headphones with um, um, accepting a binaural stream, and binaural mm -hmm. means that um, a two-channel stream can give a, an, an immersive a 3D impression of the sound signal. Um, of course, we have home hi-fi systems, which increasingly are not just two speakers, but three or five. Um, we're starting to add sound bars to our television set to have some kind of immersive experience. 
and don't underestimate the gaming market where an immersive experience, binaural and as monitor in a gaming environment is, uh, is, is becoming also a standard. Um, and in my hotel room, I saw this. This was the television, the Sony television. It's FIFA Digital HD 3D sound with Dolby vir virtual surround. Something surround. So even an ordinary television in a, in a hotel room claims to, to give some kind of immersive experience. So it's, it's, it's there and it's, it has become already almost a standard. Not stereo, but immersive surround. So, um, the thing is, that all the productions that we listen to uh, when we listen to our personal home systems are made in a studio. And in the studio, the sound engineer or the composer or the artist is always in the sweet spot in the middle of the, of the loudspeaker system. Whether it's stereo or surround uh, system, that doesn't matter, he's in the middle. When you wear headphones, you are also in the middle of that system because you have two loudspeakers and they're exactly at the same distance from your ear. So when you listen to headphones, you basically have the sweet spot, the optimum listening position for your sound system. And you wear it with you always. Um, in the cinema world, they understood this already more than 20 years ago. Um, nowadays, there is, I think, no cinema in, in the world, no professional cinema in the world that doesn't have at least a 5.1 surround system. To, to play movies, and usually it's 7.1, and the more expensive, the, the better uh, cinemas have a Dolby Atmos or a Barco Auro system. Um, so in that market, it's normal to provide an immersive experience, but in conventional life, SR, it is not. Um, we've been concentrating, uh, focusing on product development to make systems as loud as possible, and this is, this is still a continuing thing. Um, um, live sound reinforcement systems become louder every year, especially in the low frequency range. Um, we've invented ways to make the sound pressure level in the audience as uniform as possible, with maybe a few dB difference between seats. But um, uh, that's, a, that's a real, a big technical, technological uh, development. Um, and as a result, nobody is in the sweet spot. Everybody hears a loud sound, but all the positioning information, which is the basis of, uh, of, a, of an immersive impression, is gone. There is no immersivity. There's no spatial component in, in the sound field. And as a result, we basically mix, also with an expensive mixing console, we mix mono. Uh, maybe the stereo synthesizer, this puts stereo on left and right, because if you hear one channel, you still hear the, uh, the nice chorus of the synthesizer, but the rest um, is mixed basically mono. I'm charging a little bit. Okay. Um, so, in live sound reinforcement, we're a little bit behind on the personal audio world and the cinema world. They solved it, they are already on the path to uh, providing immersive uh, experiences, but live sound is at the beginning of that process. How can we improve? Um, two topics. The first one is called Sweet Line versus Sweet Audience. I will go into that later. And the second one is 1D versus 2D. First, Sweet Line versus Sweet Audience. Imagine a, a room, a concert hall like this, and imagine an audience in that concert hall. And then we deploy a stereo front of house system with two loudspeakers, one on the left, one on the right, and we will appoint three test persons to listen for us. And we listen not to sound pressure level, but to uh, spatial, spatiality, so Im immersiveness. Uh, location, if they uh, being able to locate sound sources in the mix, and our job is to put a sound source, in this case, the sound of a helicopter, somewhere right of the middle. Um, usually, if you use the pan pot, then you would pan a little bit to the right, so the same signal on the right is a little bit louder, a few dB louder than the signal on the left. However, 
the listener on the left will f hear the first sound coming from the left loudspeaker. And our brain is, um, uh, the software in our oral cortex in our brain is focused on hearing the first sound. This is the direct sound from, uh, from sound sources in our environment. And if there are sounds later, the brain will interpret, it, interpret, interpret them as reflections. So if the listener on the left hears the sounds from the left loudspeaker first, he will, his brain will think that's where the helicopter is. But the helicopter is, of course, not there. It's on the right. So he has a wrong spatial impression. The guy on the left will have the same problem because he's closer to the right speaker and he will place the helicopter to the right speaker. And the only guy who experiences the helicopter on the correct position is in the middle because he hears both loudspeakers at the same time and then the, the, the difference in level will trigger his, his mind to believe that virtually the helicopter is a little bit right to the center. So we have a green line in the middle and all the audience in this green line, they have a correct spatial impression of what we pan on our stereo system, but all the, all the listeners on the left and all the listeners on the right, which is the big majority, like 90% or more, will have the wrong expression. So whatever we do, this, this is never going to uh, allow us to have a spatial impression for all of the audience. And then, of course, these uh, members of the audience will pay less for a ticket or they will not come because the because the, ex the listening experience is not better than the, what they can experience, experience at, at, uh, at home. Um, by the way, our headphone, if we listen to this mix in our headphone, we would be in the middle of the two loudspeakers. So we would be in the perfect sweet spot. Okay. We can solve this by adding a few loudspeakers in the middle. Um, we're more or less used to LCR systems, so putting a small speaker in the, in the center for dialogue, for example. Um, but um, especially for the, for the front part of the audience, that, is, that resolution is not high enough to create a, a spatial uh, impression. And the overall agreement or the overall understanding is that at least five loudspeakers are needed instead of a left and right system to create some degree of spatial in impression. There are many research papers on this uh, uh, from ITU and from all these companies, all these loudspeaker companies that gear towards uh, the number five. Um, and if there's place and money, seven is better and nine is even better and of course, so on. So um, the mixing console or the renderer, the immersive renderer, because mixing consoles usually don't have this functionality yet, um, will mix the the object, the sound object, to the loudspeakers, the two loudspeakers closest to the object. This is uh, called vector-based audio panning VBAP, and most uh, immersive audio systems use this algorithm to, uh, to place objects in a, in a sound field. So they, they just look, calculate the two nearest loudspeakers, and then they pan the loudspeakers with level panning in between to where the object more or less is. And now all three test persons in the audience more or less can guess the correct uh, uh, position of the helicopter. So now, not just the, the middle green line, the, the sweet line has the correct impression, but the whole audience, the sweet audience, has the correct impression. So with, by only adding three loudspeakers to the front of house system, we can widen uh, the efficiency of the system so that the whole audience can enjoy uh, an immersive experience. Um, by the way, if the power that comes from this system remains the same, then uh, where you usually have two very big, long line arrays, left and right, you can build this system with smaller line arrays and with the same amount of speakers, but then uh, distribute it to five hangs instead of two. So it doesn't have to cost more. Um, maybe you need more amplifiers because every loudspeaker needs a discrete signal, of course. Okay, so um, if we go from, if we use a stereo from the house system, we have a sweet line, so a small percentage of the audience experiences a nice immersive uh, sound field. And an immersive front of house system already with five speakers 
will result in a sweet audience where everybody in the audience can perceive the positions of objects and enjoy uh, an immersive sound field. Um, same as if you would wear, wear headphones in your personal listening environment. Both of these systems are 1D. That is, you can pan an object in a line on the front of the stage. You cannot go further than the left speaker and the right speaker, and you can go, not go to the back and to the front. For this, we can apply a second technology, and um, that is called simply 2D. 1D is one-dimensional, 2D is two-dimensional. We can even add ceiling speakers to go three-dimensional, but I left that out for this presentation. So with an immersive front-of-house system, if we, place, if we want to place an object out of the stage line, out of the 1D uh, universe, then all the renderer can do is find the closest loudspeaker and put the object on that loudspeaker. And then, of course, everybody will think that the object is in the wrong position. So this doesn't work. We need to put more loudspeakers around the audience. It doesn't have to be much. Maybe eight or ten is already making a huge difference in, in the system. Uh, if you want a high resolution, you might need more. The bigger the audience, the more speakers you need. But maybe in this audience, already 5.1 would do. So if you have five loudspeakers in front of house to have a good resolution here, then maybe just one speaker there and one speaker there already improves the situation a lot. And then seven speakers is better and more is better always. So here, if we uh, locate the helicopter to the left of the audience, and reproduce it by that loudspeaker, then all persons in the audience will, of course, perceive that the helicopter is there instead of on the front line. That's a kind of an open door, but it's good to, to realize this. This is why you apply so many speakers around an audience. But this is not the only reason. Um, there's also the discussion about effects. If you have a stereo or an immersive front-of-house system, and you apply an effect, that's usually a stereo effect, then all the listeners hear the, the reverberation, the acoustic response from a virtual room from the front. And this is, of course, not natural, because you all now hear the response from this room, also from the sides and from the, from the rear. So in this situation, um, there is kind of a one-dimensional impression of the acoustics. And we got used to that in, uh, in live concerts. Um, but if you think about it, it's, it's, it's not correct. It's, um, it's less exciting than if you apply loudspeakers around the, the audience and use a multi-channel reverberation that comes from all around the audience. And then we, hear, we properly hear reflections from all directions and feel enveloped in the acoustics. And um, we, we do a tour, a training tour through Europe, and we take a system with us with 16 loudspeakers on, on poles, and we demonstrate this, and the difference is if you do an A-B comparison between the two, the two is huge. It's, it's, it really lifts the quality of the, of, a, um, of the sound reinforcement of the performance um, a lot. So, also here, the money question, customers buying tickets. Um, we can go from stereo, we can take the step to go from stereo to immersive front of house, so from two loudspeakers to five or seven. We can go from 1D, only speakers at the, on the stage proscenium, to 2D, so also speakers around the audience. And 3D, if we also place speakers in the ceiling. Um, this will increase the entertainment value, not just for the green line, but for the entire audience. And the audience um, will appreciate the better sound quality and can be seduced to keep buying tickets, so retain the audience, or if we can do this better than a, a home stereo system or a home surround system or a binaural system, which is totally possible, then we can even have a higher quality, higher uh, immersive quality in a live performance compared to a personal audio performance. So we can grow the audience. There's a reason for an audience to buy a concert ticket and, uh, and come to a live performance. And of course, uh, if it's really, really good, we can also think about increasing the ticket price. If you deliver a good entertainment value, that's, that's worth also a ticket price. Um, two more things at the end of my presentation. How about touring? Um, 
This was all related to installations in venues, but the question is, does this also work with touring productions? The answer is, we're testing this, because having more speakers means it takes more investment in equipment, it takes more time to build up and to configure the systems, um, and if there's acoustic enhancement involved, it takes also time to tune an acoustic enhancement system. And we do a lot of um, uh, uh, test projects, and this test project was a concert by the Berlin Philharmonic in Berlin last year. 20,000 uh, listeners, ticket buyers, and you can see the tent. Under the tent is the Berlin Philharmonic with no walls, only the tent roof. So there are no acoustics there. And uh, using 32 loudspeakers, we built a stage shell for them. Um, so they actually had similar uh, acoustic conditions as in the Berlin Philharmonic, um, which resulted in a better performance of the soloist uh, and the orchestra, and also in an easier recording for the OB van, the, the aired uh, broadcast, uh, live video uh, television broadcast, didn't have to add any reverberation because the hall sounded like, like a proper concert hall. Um, we, we tested, not the result, because we know this is possible, but we tested how, how much time it takes to add those 32 loudspeakers and cabling and amplifiers to the build-up process, to the rigging of the system. Um, and we found that we could go in between uh, the workflow of the existing rigging schedule with the lights and the existing PA. Um, and basically, we had just have to, had to add some staff some building staff, but the time, the build-up time, remained the same. So that's a, that's a big thing for touring companies. It doesn't have to take a long time to set up an immersive sound system. Um, and for the tuning, we tuned in the evening and during lunch breaks of the orchestra. Um, and it apparently, or apparently, we, we kind of proved that we can tune such a system in t uh, two or three hours to make a, a, a high-quality acoustic response on the stage, uh, acoustic stage shell. Um, so this is a, also an earning model maybe for rental companies who are supporting open-air concerts of, of uh, philharmonic orchestras. Um, another example is a, um, a tent, a dome tent of 12 meter in diameter, which is touring Switzerland. Um, and instead of a stereo uh, sound system, they applied a 32 loudspeaker immersive system. These are the small dots in the triangles. Um, and it takes them about four hours extra to mount 32 loudspeakers instead of two. Of course, that takes a little bit more time. Um, and sometimes they also tune it to host an, an acoustic performance. So they create a big, big acoustics inside a small dome, which is basically the, si the size as, uh, of this room. Um, and this is touring for a year now, and it's, it's being used more and more by, uh, by productions in, in Switzerland. Um, so this turns out to be a viable way of using an immersive system as well. 32 loudspeakers is, is, is big. Uh, we could, uh, this could also work with just 16 loudspeakers or maybe even less for smaller systems. So it's viable both for big projects and also for small projects to apply this in touring systems and, and to invest uh, uh, in as a rental company. So slightly over time. Ah, one minute. Very quick. Hardware. You need processors, you need amplifiers, you need loudspeakers. This is usually about 60% of the value, hardware value of a system. For immersive sound reinforcement, you have to add a mixing console and some tablets. This um, counts for about 20% of the cost of the system. And if you want to add acoustic enhancement, it's the same shared infrastructure, but you just have to add microphones and tuning. Um, so if you apply an immersive sound system, it's always um, good to consider at least to also apply an enhanced system. And if you inf invest in an enhancement system, it's always good to consider also applying uh, an immersive sound system. Conclusion, I will go to this a little bit quicker because we already know this. In the 80s, the big change in the audio in industry was digitalization. We got rid of noise, we got, rid of, we, we, we got a very high uh, dynamic range out of our systems. 
in the 90s, we had louder and louder and louder and more uniform uh, sound systems, uh, loudspeaker systems, line arrays. Uh, that was the second big change, I think, in, uh, in sound reinforcement. And the next change will be what we think and all the loudspeaker companies think is immersion, to add immersion to increase the sound quality of uh, sound reinforcement even further. That's it. Thank you very much, Ron.